Greetings everyone. Today we're going to explore a little bit about uh, acid-base balance. So we're just going to talk about how, uh, whoops, we're going to talk about how um, acids and bases are regulated in the body. We're not going to talk so much about the individual disorders or the compensatory mechanisms in this particular lecture. So the first thing we need to talk about, we're going to keep this extremely simple. We're going to keep this on the level that we need it on. Anytime we refer to an acid, there are tons of ways of defining acids. We're going to say an acid is something that gives up a hydrogen. So anytime you see an acid, we talk about an acid, we're talking about something that gives up a hydrogen. And I'll show you what that means in a second. All right, next we're going to define what a base is. A base, for our purposes, is something that gives up a hydroxyl group or a hydroxide ion. All right, so let's talk about what we're, uh, what we're mentioning here. Let's see here. So we're going to take this flask or this um, beaker. All right, we're going to demonstrate base here. We're going to demonstrate acid here. All right, so let's pick a common acid, hydrogen chloride. All right, let's pick a common base, sodium hydroxide. This is lye. You've probably used this in your, uh, they've got this in Drano. This is also muriatic acid. All right, muriatic acid is, uh, is what we refer to as hydrochloric acid. It's just another fancier name for it. All right, so let's take a look what happens here. So here's some water. This is just distilled water that's in each of these beakers. And if we take hydrochloric acid and we dump it into this water, it's going to do something called ionize. And ionize, uh, ionization is the process by which these two elements, which are bound together right now chemically, are going to separate and they're going to dissociate into their formed parts. So some of this hydrochloric acid is going to break down into a hydrogen ion and a chloride ion. All right, so here's a positive, here's a negative. Hydrogen's positive, chloride's negative. And we're going to essentially have dissociation that takes place. So anytime you take a solution or you take a molecule, and if you put that molecule into water or into some other sort of liquid and it ionizes, meaning that it breaks apart into its formed components, and in that ionization process a hydrogen is given up, we're going to call that an acid. So anytime we give up a hydrogen in the solution, we're going to call that an acid. So this gave up a hydrogen. In this case, we're going to take sodium hydroxide, we're going to dump it into some water, and it's going to dissociate into the sodium ion and the hydroxide ion or hydroxyl group. And as you can see here, anytime we give up a hydroxyl group or a hydroxide ion into the solution, that's this guy right here, if it breaks apart into a hydroxyl group, then we're going to say that this is a base. All right? Now we don't have sodium hydroxide in our bodies, that's not a natural uh, component. But we'll, uh, we do have other bases in our, in our body, and, and anytime we give this off, we're going to call that a base. All right, so hydrochloric acid, we have that in our stomach, for example. If you were to dump that into water, it would break up into hydrogen and chloride, and that is going to impact something called the pH. All right, so acid-base balance, we're talking about the definitions here of acids and bases, and hopefully you understand uh, what those things are. Now, again, if you've taken chemistry, there's, there are more definitions for all these things, but those are going to work for us. All right, so why acids and bases anyway? Well, we have this thing called pH, and pH stands for the power of hydrogen. And the power of hydrogen is a way of representing how much change hydrogen makes in a solution and how it has the ability to change the way other molecules work around it. So pH, the power of hydrogen, it's a little p, capital H, power of hydrogen, tells us about how many hydrogen ions are free in the solution. So that's the concentration of hydrogen ions. And there's a scale, of course, a pH scale, and pH is a unitless value. It's not milliliters or liters or grams or kilometers or pounds or anything else. It's unitless. And the scale ranges from 0 to 14. And let me draw that a little bit better there. I'm having trouble drawing today. All right, so 0 to 14. And 7's right in the middle. This is neutral. 
everything above here is said to be acidic. Everything below here is said to be basic or alkylotic. All right, so essentially 0 to 6.9999, this is acidic. Everything above 7 all the way up to 14 is very, very basic. So the scale refers to the power of hydrogen and the ability of a specific solution to dissociate in that solution. So if you take hydrochloric acid, for example, and you dump it into a bucket of water, that hydrochloric acid, almost 100% of that acid, is going to dissociate into hydrogen and chloride. So hydrochloric acid, really, really strong acid. So the numbers refer to the strength of the acid or the base. As we go closer to zero, the acid gets stronger. As we move away from seven and towards 14, the base gets stronger. All right, so strength has to do with how much dissociates into the solution. So for example, if you take hydrochloric acid, that's a strong acid, and it's a strong acid because if you take 100 hydrochloric acids and you put it into water, essentially you'll have 100 hydrogens and you'll have 100 chlorides. If we had a weak acid, we would take a weak acid and this acid would allow This acid would allow us to dissociate into only a couple pieces. So let's just take another acid, and we're going to say we're going to take another acid, and this acid is going to be called carbonic acid. This is another one you'll be familiar with. If you take carbonic acid and you put it in a water, some of it is going to form this, which is bicarbonate, some of it is going to form this, which is hydrogen. But if you were to take 100 of these, maybe you might get like 10 out of this and 10 out of this. And the rest would just kind of stay as carbonic acid. So very weak acid. So the strength of an acid has to do with how much of the acid actually dissociates completely when it's put into a solution. All right, so let's get rid of some of that mess so we can continue to look at, uh, at some of our pieces here. So we're going to get rid of this and we're just going to say that acid strength has to do with with how much of it is going to dissociate in the solution. All right, same thing for bases. If we have a base that's really really strong, the majority of it is going to dissociate. So that sodium hydroxide example, if you were to take 100 sodium hydroxide molecules and dump them into water, you'd get 100 sodiums and 100 hydroxyl groups. And so this is a very strong base. Again, we don't have this in our body. All right, so we need to know that because eventually we're going we're gonna to target some of these acids and bases with some of the drugs that we give uh, in emergency care. All right, so power of hydrogen comes on a scale, 0 to 14, seven's right in the middle. Uh, zero's the strongest acid, 14's the strongest base. All right, now, what does this all mean to us? If we look at the pH of blood, the pH of blood ranges 7.35 to 7.45. So that means our blood is a little bit alkalotic. It's a little bit basic. It's not acidic because it's not less than 7. So generally speaking, the pH of our blood is always a little bit more basic than neutral. All right, and this has to stay in this very, very, very fine range. And the reason for that is because this is the optimal range for all of our body functions to work well. In other words, if we take all of the molecules and proteins and all the little processes that happen, they work best at this pH in blood. Now, there are other areas in our body where the pH is going to be a little bit different. And that means that whatever's going on in that particular region is best suited for the pH either high or low depending on what that pH is in those different areas of the body. All right, so we're going to continue on here. Let's look at a few more things. We also want to look at how much hydrogen there is in the solution. So another way of looking at pH is saying that here at the very top where we were at zero, we have the most hydrogen in the solution. 
Down here we have the least hydrogen. Another way to look at this is to say we have the most hydroxide here in the base category and here we have the least amount of hydroxide. So all these things are important because we're going to start looking at ways that we can regulate 7.35 to 45 pretty strictly in this narrow range just by impacting hydrogen or hydroxide and that's essentially what we're going to do. All right, so power of hydrogen, we're going to have to maintain this strict balance of 7.35 to 7.45 which is slightly alkalotic or slightly basic. All right, so in order for us to maintain this range, we have to have different systems that regulate the amount of hydrogen that's allowed to be free in the solution. And so pH regulation is accomplished by way of something called buffer systems. And buffer systems come in three flavors. So buffer systems are systems that regulate pH by buffering the solution, buffering meaning to take out hydrogen or to put hydrogen back into the solution in order to maintain a very narrow range of 7.35 to 7.45 in the blood. So the first thing we have is the chemical buffer system. There are three of these. Chemical buffer system is designed to very very quickly act on the pH by recognizing when there is a change in the hydrogen ion concentration in the blood and if there is an increase in hydrogen concentration it's going to pick those hydrogens out of the solution and get rid of them. If there are too few hydrogens in the solution, meaning that the patient has become alkalotic or more basic, then the chemical buffer system is responsible for releasing hydrogen into the body and into the blood. Alright, so the first one we're going to look at is the chemical buffer system known as the formation and dissociation of carbonic acid. Alright, so don't get overwhelmed here. I'm going to draw this little equation. You'll have it committed to memory in no time at all. So water plus carbon dioxide. If you put those two things together you get carbonic acid. And in fact if you break apart carbonic acid you can actually get hydrogen and the bicarbonate ion. So this is called the formation and dissociation of carbonic acid. This is carbonic acid right here. And carbonic acid is a very weak acid. And weak acids are good because if you have a weak acid, that means that it doesn't impact the pH very much. If you have a strong acid, it really, really impacts the pH. And so that causes huge fluctuations in the pH. And we don't have that latitude. We really have to keep pH in a 7.35 to 7.45 mechanism. So you'll see that there are actually two separate components to this carbonic acid formation and dissociation and I'll draw your attention to them now and one of them is called the respiratory component and one of them is called the renal component. Alright so this is how this works. So it's a buffer system and buffer systems either take up hydrogen or they dump hydrogen into the body. So let's just say that we have a condition where there is an increase in hydrogen ion concentration for whatever reason. If there's an increase in hydrogen ion concentration, the blood, in fact red blood cells and in the blood plasma, very quickly this is recognized. Bicarbonate ion is made available and it combines with the hydrogen to then form carbonic acid. So we've taken a strong acid which can make huge fluctuations in the pH and we've converted it to a weak acid which is the, the carbonic acid that we have right here in the middle of this equation. So by converting from a strong to a weak acid we've already buffered the system such that we've taken hydrogen out and in addition to that we have formed a much weaker acid and it's not going to impact the pH as much. So this is one way that we can regulate. Now the other thing we can do with this as you can see on this end here is if we have a large increase in hydrogen that's going to yield a large increase in carbonic acid and eventually this large increase in carbonic acid is going to be recognized and the brain's going to deal with it by increasing the respiratory rate because if we have an increase in hydrogen that yields to an increase in carbonic acid that means that we're going to have an increase in carbon dioxide and the 
system that's responsible for eliminating carbon dioxide in the body is the respiratory system. So you have too much hydrogen, you're acidotic, you quickly, quickly form the carbonic acid molecule, which quickly dissociates into water and carbon dioxide, and your brain says, holy cow, got too much carbon dioxide, all we have to do to fix this problem is breathe a little bit faster. You breathe faster, you get rid of the CO2, and everything else normalizes. So a buffer system, the chemical buffer system, is the fastest system. It gets up and running immediately. It's a chemical reaction, so it's immediate. Immediate. So this immediately buffers any minute changes. So let's say uh, there's a teacher and they're teaching and they go from, they're eating at lunch and they come back into the classroom and they start talking. Well, as they start talking, that's going to actually impact the pH of their blood because when you change respiratory physiology in terms of the rate, you're going to change how much CO2 is retained. That's going to change all the rest of the components. So chemical buffer systems, they're immediate, they're buffer systems, they pull out, generally speaking, they pull out hydrogen out of the blood, they form carbonic acid, and they eliminate it by breathing too fast. Now we'll see this again later. All right? We're going to talk about all the different diseases that can cause an increased respiratory rate as a result of acidosis. We'll th talk about things like diabetic ketoacidosis. The reason those folks are hyperventilating is because they have too much acid in their blood as a result of a metabolic condition. And one of the ways that our body compensates for that is by breathing faster. So we'll revisit this in just a little bit. All right, so that's the chemical buffer system. All right, let's take a look at the next guy. Next guy is we're going to look at the respiratory buffer system. So the respiratory buffer system is a mechanism that essentially uh, regulates pH indirectly by eliminating or retaining CO2. All right, so carbon dioxide, if you haven't figured it out by now, is an acid. So this is an acid component. So if you take carbon dioxide and you withhold it, you increase the amount of acid. If you take carbon dioxide and you get rid of it, you decrease the amount of acid. So this is what it looks like. So if you take a patient and they are, um, and they, they stop breathing, they're, we're gonna say they are hypoventilating for whatever reason. We'll talk about the diseases later. So if you have a patient that's hypoventilating, one of the things that's going to happen is you're going to have an increase in CO2 in the lungs. If you have an increase in CO2 in the lungs, you're going to dissociate that to carbonic acid. You're going to dissociate that into hydrogen and the bicarbonate ion. That means you're going to have an increase in hydrogen ion concentration, which means you're going to have an a decrease in the pH, meaning that the pH number will decrease. So if you started at normal at 7.4 and you stop breathing for some period of time, CO2 is going to build up. And if you remeasure that pH, that pH might be 7.3 or something lower. All right. Conversely, patient hyperventilating, decreased amount of CO2 in the lungs. This yields to a decreased hydrogen ion concentration, which yields an increase in pH, such that if we started at 7.4, we would end at 7.5. So the respiratory buffer system is a mechanism of regulating the pH in this strict range of 7.35 to 7.5 by doing nothing more than changing the respiratory rate. So the respiratory system regulates pH as a buffer system by changing the rate. All right, let's look. Last but not least, we should look at the third buffer system, and this is the renal buffer system. So chemical buffer system has the ability to act immediately, but it only has the ability to change pH a little bit. The respiratory buffer system has takes a few minutes, one, three, four, five minutes for it to get up and running, Respiratory system, even though it takes a little longer to start, it has the ability to change or to have a greater impact on pH than does the chemical system. 
And last but not least, the renal system. This one might take hours or days to get up and running fully, but the renal system has the greatest impact potential on pH. Greatest impact potential on pH regulation. All right, so how do the kidneys do this? Well, the kidneys do this a bunch of ways. For one, they have the ability to filter things such as hydrogen and things such as bicarbonate. They also have the ability to make the bicarbonate ion. All right, so here's how this works. The renal system is activated. Let's say the pH is really low. Let's make it 7.2. So the patient is very acidotic. All right, the patient's acidotic. So the kidneys go, holy cow, if the patient's acidotic, that means I have to do two things. I should filter hydrogen and eliminate it. So I'm going to put this in the urine, which it does. And I should filter the bicarbonate ion and I should save this. So if I decrease hydrogen and I increase the bicarbonate, the result of this is that the pH goes up. So we might be back in the 7.4 7 region. Now, the other thing that it will do is it will say, in addition to uh, eliminating hydrogen and keeping the bicarbonate that I have, I'm also going to make the bicarbonate ion, and I'm going to increase the production of bicarbonate ion, again, with the end result being that the pH goes up. All right, so a couple things, a couple relationships to remember. As the amount of hydrogen ions increases, the pH decreases. As the amount of hydrogen ions decrease, the pH increases. As the amount of bicarbonate ions increases, the pH also increases. As the bicarbonate ion decreases, the pH also decreases. So these are directly related and these oppose one another. So hydrogen and pH, more hydrogen, the decreased pH number, these are opposite of one another. Conversely, with bicarb, if bicarb goes up, pH goes up. Bicarb goes down, pH goes down. So renal has the greatest impact on pH regulation. It does that by getting rid of any excess hydrogen, by storing bicarb that it already has, and by making more bicarb as needed to regulate the pH. So these three systems are essentially working in concert with one another 24-7 to try to maintain this very, very, very strict level of regulation such that the pH of the blood is maintained in this narrow range of 7.35 to 7.45 constantly. All right, so we're going to talk more about different disease processes. We're also going to talk about compensatory mechanisms of pH regulation in just uh, in another lecture. Stay tuned.